Now, neither side was prepared for civil war, or certainly for the war that happened. Um, but this, they were both disorganized, you might say. Disorganized. Modern warfare requires organization. Neither side was organized. But, but the pro that was a much greater problem for the Union than the Confederacy because their task was that much greater. Prior to 1860, throughout the, ever since Andrew Jackson's days, there had been a series of weak presidents and governmental inactivity. The federal government was very weak. Um, there was no national banking system through which to mobilize economic resources, which war is very expensive. In fact, the, the economic system of the federal government in 1861 was what they call the independent treasury, which had come about in 1841, I think. No, well, under Van Buren, I guess. Um, as, a, as an alternative to the Bank of the United States. There had been this central bank, which would have been useful, but Jackson had destroyed it, and the independent, the independent treasury just meant that the treasury just took money and stuck it under its bed. It just put it in its vault, and that's it. There was no, it was no national banking system whatsoever. In fact, legally speaking, the government had to make its payments in gold. It had a whole gold around the country to pay. It was ridiculous. And in fact, very soon into the war, they just ran out of money. So there was no way. They, so they began, for the, we'll see this, printing paper money for the first time, the federal government. There was no finance system in place that could actually finance the war. There were no taxes, a utopia. The only tax was the tariff, which had actually been national tax, which had been reduced almost down to nothing. There were local taxes, but the federal government had no tax base to raise uh, uh, funding. Um, there, were ex there was an extensive railroad network, but no national system. There were eight different railroad gauges in the north. In other words, different lines. D the gauge is the distance you know, between the two tracks. So a train from the Illinois Central cannot go onto the tracks of the New York Central, let's say, because it's different. The wheels are different. So, you couldn't, that made it again difficult to just use the transportation network to get resources to uh, where they needed to be. Um, there were no maps of any use. A Union army would march into Virginia and come upon a river that wasn't on the map. What is this here? I didn't know we had to cross a river, but you know, the maps were very, uh, very, there were no national statistics of any use. No one knew really how much manufacturing there was or what the output of different things was. Um, and most manufacturing was very small scale. As I said, there were a lot of manufacturing in the North, but it was very small scale and not so easy to mobilize for a war effort. Um, this did not, all this did not stop, of course, great enthusiasm on the part of people. Uh, let's see where we can find our, um, here we go. This, I think I showed this weeks ago, but this is the departure of the 7th Regiment. I like this, this lithograph from New York City. Soon after the war begins, people rally to the flag. They march. You can find similar things in the South. They're all off to fight, and it's a big romantic and, you know, uh, romantic thing. When they do go and find, they become immense armies. So many people, this is just an army camp with the tremendous number of, of tents and troops lined up. You know, this is just one picture of a Union um, army camp. But the army was not prepared for this kind of war. Uh, the largest army anyone had ever seen in North America was 14,000 men. That was the army that had fought in the Mexican War. Suddenly you're getting hundreds of thousands of men, none of whom had any military experience joining the army. Maybe they had been in the local state, the local militia, but the local militias just got around and drank all day, basically. That was what they did. They did they, or they'd march around in different directions, but they didn't actually do anything much militarily. Um, how do you supply a mass army? Where does the food come from? And everything else you need, uniforms, clothes, you know, blankets, everything, tents, horses, you, you name it, you ha these have to be mobilized in some way. Um, and the size of these armies was itself a problem for 
quick action. People would say, yeah, let's move, let's go there. But it was kind of hard to get armies this size into motion. Um, a lot of the Civil War is fought in the very unglamorous realm of just supplying, of the commissary department, of getting things, just mobilizing resources to supply the army with weapons, but also with everything else it needs. Very prosaic, managing resources, uh, figuring out modern managerial techniques to keep track of what the heck is being um, gathered by the army. Um, it was difficult at first. Eventually, the Union does defeat the South in this realm of getting, of ordnance, you know, of just getting, getting things to the army and figuring out how to do that. So the regular army, the standing army in 1861, the professional army consisted of 14,000 men. The commander in chief, the general in chief of the Union Army was Winfield Scott, who had been born in 1786 before the Constitution was quite overweight and in fact infirm and could not ride a horse, or at least get up there to ride it. Um, there were various other types of people uh, in militias, tens of thousands in various states of readiness, um, but you exhausted that pretty quickly. Pretty soon, both sides had to resort to conscription, that is to the draft, to force people into the army. The South did it first in 1862, the North did it in 1863, because eventually en voluntary enlistment is not doing the, doing the trick. The Navy wasn't in the greatest shape either. Lincoln very early declared a blockade of the Confederate co uh, coast, okay? Blockade of the Confederacy. That was a cool idea completely impossible to enforce. The Confederate coastline is almost 4,000 miles long uh, with 200 rivers, bays, inlets. Um, the army at the beginning of the war had 90 vessels. Uh, less than half of them were steam, the others were sailing ships. Many of them were scattered all over the world. There were some on a goodwill mission to Japan and things like this. So for much of the war, um, Here's where I will surprise you by citing Gone with the Wind. You may remember that uh, Rhett Butler uh, goes off to uh, be a blockade runner uh, uh, and, and to make money. He's, he's, he thinks the war is ridiculous, but he says, hey, you know, he can make money running things in through the blockade, and there's no danger. The blockade running was a totally, uh, you know, easy thing to do, and you could make a lot of money. It was not dangerous because it was almost impossible for much of the war to enforce anything remotely like a blockade. But even more important than all of this the, is the mental unpreparedness. The leaders of both sides were simply not prepared for the war that actually happened. They'd been educated in very traditional notions of warfare. Um, that is, war, short wars, won by maneuver and occupying territory or strategic points, conducted according to a kind of almost chivalry notion of what you, you know, professional action, um, and um, run by professional soldiers. That's the point. You know, 100,000 men is not an army. 100,000 people may turn up at a soccer match, you know, but that's not an army. That's just a big crowd of people. Turning them into an army takes a good while, if it ever can be done. And they, the, many of the generals were very skeptical of citizen soldiers being able to actually go out and do anything very effective. There were about 900 officers of the US Army in 1860, 61. One third of them were allowed to resign and join the Confederacy. That could not, can you imagine that today where we allowed a third of our officers to join the Taliban or something? No, you don't do that. But this was a kind of concept of war as a, there were rules of war, it was a gentlemanly thing, a professional thing. Um, and certainly most of the generals, not all, they were abolitionist generals, most of them said this is not about slavery or more to the point, you don't attack the economic or social institutions of the opposing side. A war is fought of army against army and you leave everything else uh, to the side.